And within the last few minutes, the Queen has sent a personal message to Lady Wilson. It's become one of the abiding images of 20th century politics. Harold Wilson, aged eight on the steps of number 10, snapped by his father in 1924. Yet at Oxford in the late 30s, he seemed certain to become a high-flying academic, not a prime minister. And his victory at Ormskirk in the Labour landslide of 45 was a sharp change of direction. Two years later, though, at age just 30, he was president of the Board of Trade, with a clipped moustache and vowels to match in a ministerial broadcast about rationing. I wish I could have taken sheets right off the ration, but sheetings like shirtings, uh, are one of our best exports. 16 years on, after Hugh Gaitskell's death in 1963, it was Harold Wilson who'd become a major figure on the Bevanite left of the party who won the leadership contest. And it was Harold Wilson who overturned a 100-seat Tory majority the following year. Soon, though, the first of the many financial crises he had to weather, but when he went to the country again in 66, Labour was returned with a 97-seat majority. The time, of course, became known as the swinging 60s, and Harold Wilson caught the mood of national change with his talk of the white heat of the technological revolution. There was the music of the Beatles, there was biting satire too. Harold Wilson was often mocked, but he made sure that he was seen with those the younger generation adored. But economic troubles were soon to plunge his second administration into real trouble, with devaluation and the famous pound-in-your-pocket broadcast of November 1967. From now on, the pound abroad is worth 14% or so less in terms of other currency. That doesn't mean, of course, that the pound here in Britain, in your pocket or purse or in your bank, has been devalued. As he struggled with trade union reform as well, he began to acquire the reputation of an arch wheeler dealer, trying to keep everyone happy. To the point where in May 69, with left and right plotting against him, he needed to assert his leadership. I know what is going on. I am going on. Despite all the problems, Wilson went into the 1970 election a clear favourite, but he lost against Edward Heath. He was to return to Downing Street, though, amid all the chaos of the miners' strike and the three-day week just four years later. There were important achievements during this second spell in office, notably the renegotiation of British membership of the common market and the clear vote in favour of us staying in Europe in the referendum which followed. But increasingly he felt that he'd had enough, that his powers were declining. He'd in fact decided a full year before he resigned in 1976 to be succeeded by Jim Callaghan that he would step down. But his record has stood. Labour's longest serving Prime Minister of recent years and the last one to win not just one but four general elections. Labour leaders past and present had made the journey to the island which played an increasingly important part in Lord Wilson's life. It was an occasion when key figures in his political career, Lady Falconder and Lord Callaghan, could meet again before the service began. But it was as much a gathering of local residents, many of whom knew Lord Wilson. Lady Wilson had insisted that most of the church should be reserved for the islanders themselves. The service reflected the makeup of the congregation, with reflections on Lord Wilson as a local and a national figure. Tony Blair read one of the two lessons. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. In a tribute, the former speaker, Lord Tonopandi, said that Lord Wilson had burnt himself out for Britain. History is certain to place Lord Wilson of Revo among its parliamentary giants. At his peak, and his peak lasted for years, he dominated Parliament. But for islanders, he'll be remembered as one of them. I have caught their sense of pride and thankfulness 
that Lord Wilson has been brought home to the place he loved greatly and which brought him joy and wonder and refreshment of spirit for over 40 years. Local links were emphasized with lifeboat men from the island carrying the coffin out of the church. Representatives from other local services led the procession to the private burial. The half mile walk took them past Lord Wilson's modest bungalow where he had spent some of the more contented periods of his life.